morning, everyone. It, it's good to see all of you here. And see that it's good to know, Marianne, you have raised your family right. They're in full church mode, mode because they're all seated in the back. So, good job. Good job there. But I welcome you uh, this morning for worship. I bring to you uh, greetings from Gary Butdorf's family, who thank you for all the cards and notes that you've sent uh, to them with expressions about uh, Gary's place in the life of the church and your lives. They have appreciated it very much. It was a hot day up in Fremont. But I was so glad to see so many people. There were over 40 people at the graveside service for Gary. And so that was indeed good to see. I met high school friends, elementary school friends. It was just really good. And we gathered for a fellowship afterwards at Gary's home church. So it was a difficult, hard day, but a really fitting uh, last tribute to Gary. I want to remind all the people a part of the Chosen Study, we are meeting this Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the morning, so mark that on your calendars. Also, mark on your calendars next Sunday, and you'll get a note about this to bug you during the middle of the week. We're having Faith, Food, and Song next Sunday. We're going to start a little earlier because this is going to be a different kind of service. We're going to do a lot of singing with uh, more dulcimers than I ever want to see in one place at one time. So, but we'll, we'll have them all there. And if you don't know why I made that comment, you don't know my history with dulcimers. And Tom and Donna will be happy to fill you in on it. Are there any other announcements we need to make this morning for the good of the gathered fellowship? Then let us, with the sound of the prelude, let us worship God.
shot in the face of a raging giant. Strina is accepting vulnerability from inside the boat. Strength is standing in solidarity with the powerless. Strength is turning the cheek. Strength is loving an enemy. We come to worship. As God redefines our vision of strength.
your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield-bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. This ends the reading from the Old Testament. Thank you, Donna. As we gather today, we carry all of life with us. It's joys that give us buoyancy in life. It's concerns that at times weigh us down. And it is within these moments that we express those to God and with one another. That by sharing joys, our joy may be heightened. And that by sharing our concerns and sorrows, our burdens may be lightened. As we come today, of course, we'll continue to remember within our prayer, Gary's, Butthor's friends and family. His son, Chris, sends his greetings to you today. We'll also to remember Marcia. She is to be transferred to an acute rehab, rehab facility either today or sometime early within the week. Let us remember her. She is doing better because I put a sarcastic meme on my Facebook page and she gave me a thumbs up. So, so she's, she's doing better and for that we are thankful. And continue to remember John Pierce as he recovers from broken soap shoulder and shoulder surgery and it continues within rehab. As we gather this day, are there other words of joy, words of concern we wish to lift up and share? Donna? I'd like to remember Dee Dee and Alan Barone. Let us remember Dee Dee and Alan Barone. They're both dealing with serious health issues in their lives. 
John. The individual who was hurt in, down in Kings Island. Okay, let us remember him and his family and circles of friends. Glenda. Okay, we'll remember all of that in prayer for you. Then let us assemble these thoughts within our hearts as we join together in this our prayer of confession. O oh God, sometimes we are like David and sometimes like Goliath. Forgive us for our two-sided nature. We face the powerful with righteous anger, but cling to any sense of power that we attain. We are grateful when grace is extended to us, yet remain absent-minded of this when others have wronged us. We treat our own as family, yet ignore sisters and brothers whom we see only from a distance. As a people of paradox, we long for oneness with ourselves and others, with Christ in creation so that justice may flow freely. Amen. Receive these words of assurance this day. Fear not. God is with us, stilling the storms and raging fears in our lives. Place your trust in God always. Amen. Let us each be in prayer. O gracious God of all creation, hear our prayers as we gather this day. Our prayers for those within our families and within our knowledge who struggle with health and injury and need a touch that reassures them, that love surrounds them, that love supports them, and love will carry them. Be with our community as many people have suffered in this past week through the heat wave we have experienced. Bring coolness, we pray, upon the land so that people may be relieved to live in wholeness and with fullness. Be with our world, gracious Lord. There is so much that separates us that we allow to separate us, our differences of opinions, of political allegiance, of color, of skin, of ethnicity, and even of faith. Make us one, gracious Lord. Help us to see that we are all your children, created in your image, that is diverse, colorful, and filled with abundant possibilities and care. Be with us. Help our leaders. Help us be better stewards of this world, to care for it, to leave it as a legacy, to continue for generations after us, so they can see and experience the glory of your presence through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who leads us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
let us in these moments reflect on the goodness of God that has touched each of our lives, that is represented in all that we give to God's kingdom. Amen. The Gospel reading for this day comes from Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, 
Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And waking up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be silent, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? They were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? These are the words of God for the children of God this day. Thanks be to God. True confession. I do not swim. I have tried to learn several times. The first time was thrust upon me, which is probably why, as a young child, I garnered a great fear of the water. We were on one of the few joint family vacations the Klein family ever took together. My dad's family and my Uncle Tom's family is up in Michigan. I can still remember the dock where it happened. My Uncle Tom, as much as I loved him, was a great believer in teaching people to swim the way he was taught to swim. The way he taught his two boys, my cousin David and my cousin Tom, to swim. It was simply the sink or swim method. Throw them into the water. And they either sink or they swim. That's how he learned to swim. That's how his son learned to swim. He decided that's how his nephew was going to swim. Throw him into the water. You either sink or swim. Two choices. I chose sink. And I can remember sitting on the bottom of the water here when he came down to get me. It was years then before I ever ventured back to even try to learn to swim. And I tried to learn to swim down here at the Fairborn Y. I think I had just graduated college and probably it was because of some girl. I decided to take swimming lessons. And in my first few lessons at the Y I had a re really nice instructor. She was really good and helpful and I was making progress. She was really kind and supportive, empathetic, which is what I needed to make any headway. When I came back for either my third or fourth lesson and she was gone. She was gone, replaced by someone who interest, lady who introduced herself to us as a former army drill sergeant. I thought to myself, this isn't going to go well. And it didn't. I finally, I, I, I heard more words I'd never heard that day as she tried to explain things to me. I walked out of there and I never went back. So there is a bit of a fear of water in me. As long as I have a life jacket, I'm okay. I've taken many a youth group on uh, canal trips have been turned over in, in the boat on canoe trips and floated just fine with the life jacket, but don't get me near water much without a life jacket. I'm fine then. Today, many years later, my inability to swim in some ways still haunts me. 
but it's not what you think. Of course, I stay clear of water on most occasions, but I really struggle to swim to the other side of the deep waters of change that go on through life. With all the change happening, at times I struggle to keep my head above water. I can't catch the rhythm of a stroke, and the deep change gives me a sinking feeling that almost scares me to death. Our Bible text today finds the disciples with a similar struggle. Jesus is teaching on the western bank of the Sea of Galilee. The crowd grows so large that he has to use a boat as a makeshift teaching platform. He is preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, wanting people to put into practice the words he's been saying, and people are flocking to him. The crowds are growing larger and larger, and Jesus teaches in parables. Sometimes people understand it, other times people don't. So he explains it to them on occasion, and on other days he leaves them to struggle with the parable. But later this day, as Mark reports, maybe exhausted from exerting himself, he pulls his disciples aside and says to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. Following Jesus' request, they set sail at the widest point of the Sea of Galilee. From the west to the east, a distance of almost 13 miles. No sooner than they begin to cross this 13-mile stretch than Jesus falls asleep. Now, I can imagine on this uh, adventure the disciples talking amongst themselves perhaps engaged in figuring out what did the parables mean, perhaps wondering what was going to happen once they reached the eastern shore. Is it going to be more the same? Are we going to be treated, treated and greeted by big crowds pressing in on Jesus, demanding more of his time and our time? Before they could answer any of those questions in their own minds, it happened. The swirling hot air rose, the cool air fell to transform the calm sea into a violent, violent whirlpool. Waves were more than merely a couple feet in a nice afternoon across the lake. They were choppy. The wind started to toss the boat back and forth. What began as a simple request to cross to the other side had now become the perfect storm. It must have scared the disciples to death. Now some of the disciples on this boat were expert fishermen and they would navigated the Sea of Galilee with storms before, but this time it even seemed different to them. The waves were so turbulent, the waters began to flood into the boat, and panic set in. They feared for their lives, and all the while, Jesus is asleep on a cushion. They shake him as hard as they can. Teacher, teacher, don't you care about us? Don't you care that we are about to die? And I can imagine Jesus rising to assess the situation, calmly looks it over, and then as Mark's report simply says, silence, be quiet. And just as fast as the storm started, the winds abruptly died down, the sea became calm. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Why are you frightened? Don't you have any faith yet? The disciples are puzzled in asking themselves, Well now, really, who is this guy? Yes, we know he 
gives amazing teachings and parables. We've seen him do things that only God could do, but we've never seen anything like this. He talks to the wind and the water, and they obey him. Jesus was asleep during a storm in the disciples' lives. Now, I don't know about you, but this is where I find troubling aspects of the story that stand out to me. You see, if I were in that boat at that time, my fear of water would appear, and I would relive all of my failed swimming experiences. I would feel like I'm about to drown, and it doesn't seem like Jesus is understanding what is going on in my life at this moment. Maybe you've had the same experience. Perhaps you're experiencing something where you're struggling to keep your head above life's turbulent waters, and you can't figure out why God is silent. Where is God in the midst of your storm? And perhaps like the disciples, you shake your fist at heaven and yell at God, don't you care about me? I'm about to die here. Why don't you come and rescue me? The second thing that's personally troubling, and it seems kind of strange, is that it's Jesus' idea to cross the sea at its widest point. What was he thinking? He's supposed to know all of life. Was he only thinking about himself, that he was tired? What about his followers? there been any times in your life when you think you're getting the short end of the deal, the short end of the stick? Perhaps you're waiting on something that you've been praying about for a long, long time, and all you've heard is deafening silence. Nothing's happening. Maybe you're praying for a miracle, and you've prayed without ceasing, you've even for this petition your A1 list prayers to pray with you and for you to intercede on your behalf, but still your prayers seem to go unanswered. Like a rubber ball, they bounce off the ceiling and come right back to us. But there is good news in this text. The fact that Jesus tells them to cross to the other side of the lake suggests to me that he will be present when we are crossing and dealing with obstacles, problems, uncertain situations that confound our lives. And just as I learned the disciples have to face their fears and cross over to the other side. As long as I have my life vest on, I'm okay in water. With Jesus asleep in their boat, they must cross over through the choppiness, the disorder of chaos, where sunny skies turn dark and gray, where angry clouds show up. water runs deep. Like the disciples there, I've shaken my fist at God before, shouting, don't you care about me? But all along, I found out I was focusing on the wrong thing. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to get distracted by storms and forget that Jesus is in our boat. Faith says that if Jesus is in the boat and the boat is going through a storm, if we're able to step back and take a look and get out of our triggered fear reaction, 
there's a good chance that we'll see him there and he'll calm our storm. If we're in the presence of Christ, then we'll be okay. Oh, we might get a little wet, wet. We may get completely drenched and soggy, but we'll be okay because of the one who created the sky and the sea, the one who was with creation, the spirit of God that hovered over the waters. Perhaps this story from Mark is a creation story for faith in our lives. I know it is for me when I get down, when I get distracted, it can only focus on the storm around me instead of Jesus in my boat, in my life. I get exhausted, I fret, I get tired, and I need rest. Know that in your most difficult days, when the storms are of life are raging, Christ is in your boat. Maybe he's asleep, but he's still in your boat. And I would rather have a sleeping Jesus in my boat than be on a large luxury cruise ship out in the middle of the ocean with all the amenities when life gets rough and the seas get rough. What about you, friends, today? Is Jesus in your boat? The boat represents our lives. Maybe your boat has drifted away from him. Maybe at one time you were close to him, but today you feel like he's miles away. Perhaps that, would it, that is what it feels like for Jesus to be asleep in the boat. But the good news is that Jesus is never too far away from us to be awakened by our cries. So will you call out to Jesus? Will you trust Christ when things get out of hand? When, will you call when your boat begins to shake? and it feels like you're ready to sink and drown in life. As you cross the obstacles and places of uncertainty in your life, can you, will you allow yourself to call out to the one who can speak peace in your life and say, winds calm down, waves cease. I still don't know how to swim. I've taken it off my bucket list. But I've placed my faith and my hope and trust in the one who sleeps in my boat as I cross to life's other sides. Thanks be to God. have a privilege today I often do not get to experience that a couple that I have had the great privilege of officiating their wedding that I get to celebrate in the baptism of their their child so I'll ask Michelle Andrew and Theo and the godparents to come forward at this time and if you, as members of the congregation, will turn in your worship folders to the insert for the sacrament of baptism. you know when we conclude with the commendation today 
you usually just carry the little one around and let you see, but I've been told that Theo likes to high five. Do you high five me? High five? Yeah. <laughs> he likes to high five. So at the conclusion, we're going to play Jesus Loves Me, and Darren and Michelle and grandparents will take him around. Godparents will take him around so he can get yourselves close to the aisle. You know, move. You're allowed to move this morning. And Theo will probably high five you very nicely. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated to God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water in the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us. To Theo's parents and godparents, I ask you these questions. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of the world, and repent of your sin? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, answer, I do. I do. Will you nurture Theo into Christ's holy church? That by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself and to profess faith openly and to lead a Christian life. If so, answer, we will. We will. Members of the congregation gathered here together today. Do you as Christ's body here at Trinity United Church of Christ affirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, answer, we do. We do. As you mature, as you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life, will you include Theodore James now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Theodore James with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through waters. After the flood, you set the clouds a rainbow. You saw your people as slaves in Egypt and led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought forth through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water, and Theo, as he receives it, to wash away sin, to clothe him in righteousness throughout all the days of his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. Spirit, 
that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple all the days of your life. How about a high five? <laughs> Members of the household of faith, I commend to your love and care Theo James. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, to perfect his love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you and welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and within this congregation of the United Church of Christ. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Michelle, and Darren, and Theo, and his family, may the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you in the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace forever. We'll bring Theo around as the hymn plays, and you'll sing in high five. <laughs> standing in life's calm boat upon the lake or asleep as it is tossed upon life's water know that Jesus loves you and cares and comes to 